Before we look into the Word, let's pray, and then we will study together. Gracious Father, we do thank you for this uh, time again, this unique time, Lord, where as your people we come together uh, out of the busyness of a week, and we say this is important enough that as we begin a new week, we want to be here and we want to be together. We want it to be ministered to by you, your Spirit, by your Word. Uh, we want to rejoice and praise you, Father, for who you are, to, to just acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and our Savior to be thankful that the Spirit of God lives within us, this amazing mystery and miracle of new birth. Lord, thank you that today, we, especially, we celebrate with, with baptism this unique service that we as Christians enter into, uh, that no one else in, in expressing faith in you uh, exercises this, this unique opportunity to say to the world, we belong to you. So thank you for that, Father. Thank you for for this privilege that you give to us. Lord, I thank you for each person that's here. I pray, Father, that your word and your spirit will, in fact, minister to each of our hearts in a way that only you can. I pray that we will be encouraged as a result of spending time together, spending time uh, acknowledging you as our Lord and our God, and spending time opening our heart to the teaching of your word. We pray, Father, for your goodness and your grace to flow in abundance this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, a number of years ago, two individuals, uh, Christian Smith and Melinda Denton, researchers with the National Study of Youth and Religion at the University of North Carolina, did a study of over 3,000 teenagers. They, in fact, interviewed over 3,000 teenagers concerning their religious beliefs. A summary of their work was presented and said this, Christian Smith and Melinda Denton have coined a phrase that describes perfectly the dominant American religion, moralistic therapeutic deism, moralistic therapeutic deism. Most teenagers believe in a combination of works righteousness, religion as psychological well-being, and a distant non-interfering God. Even these researchers recognize that this creed is a far cry from Christianity with no place for sin, no place for judgment, salvation, or Christ. Consider how many Christian publications, sermons, and teachings are nothing but moralism. So you have moralistic, therapeutic deism. Think of how many publications, sermons, and teachings are nothing but moralism. Just do the best you can. Do good. Consider how many of the uh, consider how many of the sermons, teachings, and talk about God in a generic way, not in the Father, all right? Consider how many sermons and teachings are primarily therapeutic, just make you feel good. They say nothing about God as Father who has created and sustains the world. They say nothing about the Son who became the incarnate Son of God to provide for the salvation of His people and the Holy Spirit who works through the Word to bring us to faith. Well, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because whether it's in the first century or the 21st century, we still have this, don't we? We still have moralistic, therapeutic deism as often a driving force of what people believe and what they pursue in terms of their spiritual life or in terms of religion. David Wells wrote a book a number of years ago that describes it perfectly, and the title is No Place for Truth. No place for truth. Turn again, if you would, to 2 Peter. As we work our way through this little epistle, 2 Peter brings us this morning to uh, a a place in the second chapter and verses uh, 17 through 22 and then on into the first couple of verses of chapter 3 that we want to look at this morning. This is a very short little book, isn't it? It's a very short little letter, but we've already discovered that it contains some of the strongest most vigorous language in all of the Bible. And this section that we're in that started in chapter 2 and and really goes through the end of this chapter, probably if you just picked one chapter in all of Scripture would fit into that category of very well being the strongest uh, of all of the language in the Word of God. In this passage this morning, we kind of transition from that stronger, more vigorous language, and Peter takes us to what I would describe as something more somber, more cautionary 
because he tells us that God's Word never glosses over our potential failings. He never covers over the potential failings of his children, but rather he encourages us to pay attention. He wants us to hold on and to, and to realize the warnings of Scripture for what they are, and he wants us to stay alert to the things that God has told us in his Word. Very quickly, let's review these, these verses in this second chapter and the, the, the characteristics and the teaching of these false teachers we're just describing in four ways this morning. First of all, they humanize God. As a, as a matter of doctrine, they humanize God. They bring God into a, 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 a definition that they can control. They bring God into a, into a, a format that they can uh, manage, if you will. And so they humanize God. They make him small enough to where they can control him and they can control his message. And usually the first thing to go when people humanize God is his holiness. And when the holiness of God goes, then we don't have to worry about things like sin anymore, do we? We don't have to worry about things like judgment. We don't have to worry about needing a savior. We don't have to worry about accountability. All of the things that, uh, of course, are a part of what God has told us in his word. The second thing they do is they deify man. They deify man. When God becomes small, guess who becomes big? So we, we, we bring God down into a manageable size, and as we bring God into this manageable size that we can control, then all of a sudden humanity grows and, and we become the, the main players, if you will, on the stage. And you remember a couple of weeks ago when I mentioned that incident that happened in the church in Atlanta where that pastor was actually wrapped in that scroll uh, what I didn't tell you is that, that a part of that video clip that is available, or at least it was, shows as a part of that ceremony of, of really putting this man in a position of being declared king, they, they sat him on a throne, and they had four men lift up each corner of the chair, and they hoisted him into the air, while the entire throng of people, thousands upon thousands, stood and cheered and clapped wildly. And, and that, that's just a picture of what happens when you bring God down and you put him into the, the format and the definition that you want him to be rather than how he has declared himself, then you magnify yourself. The third thing that happens then just naturally is you minimize sin. You minimize sin. A, a natural progression that happens when you humanize God and you deify man, which leads us to the last characteristic, and that is they ostracize the Scriptures. They, they, they banish the Scriptures. They minimize the Scriptures. They adjust the Scriptures. They ignore the Scriptures. Whatever we need to change, we change to fit our worldview, our perspective, the way we want to look at things. So false teachers fit right into this category that we just described at the beginning. They are happy to be moralistic, therapeutic deists. Peter, not so much. All right, let's look at at, the, at these verses, beginning at verse 17, I want to read Second Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. Let's see what he has to say in these last uh, verses of this chapter. These are springs without water, and mist driven by a storm, for whom the black, the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of corruption." For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So let's look then, first of all, at what it is that makes these false teachers and false teaching so dangerous. And as you look at these verses, uh, these are challenging verses. Peter, this isn't his first set of challenging verses to give to us, is it? If you were with us in the first letter, you knew that there was a section in there that was very difficult to interpret and understand. And, and, uh, and obviously, we, you aren't going to be dogmatic in uh, coming to those verses. And we have another set that's like that here. These are challenging verses, and many different interpretations are given about these. 
But what oftentimes happens is people come to a verse like this, a set of verses, and they read almost uh, superficially, and they draw conclusions before perhaps they really see what these words are, are saying to us. And this is a passage that people often turn to to say, you can lose your salvation. Because as we read this, it's going to sound like, uh-oh, something bad just happened to these people, and it would be interpreted by some to be a loss of their salvation. We're going to suggest that that's not the case. We're also going to suggest that it isn't a matter of people who, peop- who uh, people thought were saved but weren't. So I think there's another way to look at these verses, and we're going to see what that is. There's two groups of people involved here, and I hope that helps us to put together what's going on. The first group I'm simply referring to as unbelieving false teachers. Unbelieving false teachers. It doesn't mean that all false teachers are unbelievers. That's not, Peter's not saying to us here, by definition, all false teachers are not believers because there are false teachers who wander away from the truth and teach things that are not a part of or in addition to Scripture. But in this specific passage, these false teachers, clearly he's calling out and describing as being those who do not believe in in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Three things that he says about them that make them very dangerous. And the first is they promise much, but they deliver little. Look at verse 17. These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm from whom the black darkness has been reserved. That verse and what Peter says about them, that they promise much, but they deliver little, reminds me of those commercials those emails that you get that, that ask you if you'd like to make an extra $5,000 a month, right? Would you like to make an extra $5,000 a month? Well, who wouldn't want to make an extra five? No, I don't need an extra $5,000 a month. For $5,000 a month, you can do this part-time. You can do this at home. You maybe can stay in bed and do this. It's so easy. I don't know. But they promise you a lot, don't they? They say it's so easy to make four or $5,000 a month part-time while, while you're at home. So they promise a lot, but I'm sure they're not delivering very much. And that's what these false teachers do. They look real, but they're fake. They seem to be offering something of substance, but it's really just emptiness. It would appear that they are promising hope, but what they end up delivering is really despair to people. Peter refers to them in that verse as being springs of water, and they are mists of a storm. Remember Peter's readers lived in a very dry, arid climate, almost desert-like. And so when he describes these people as being a well, well, what did a well represent? A well represented refreshment. A, a well represented the, uh, the capacity in some instances to, to stay alive, didn't it? And so when you describe these people as being a well, that communicated that they were going to refresh you. They were going to renew you. They were going to give you something that you desperately needed in that climate. They're like a mist of a storm that just quickly passes by is the way Peter describes them. They give nothing because they have nothing to give. They promise a lot, but they deliver little. And when I thought of that, I thought, what, what an, an amazing contrast between those false teachers and the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing contrast between what he says in verse 17 about those false teachers and Jesus in John 4. Jesus in John 4 in his conversation with the woman at the well. And he promises her, woman, if you knew the water that I could give you, you would realize that the water that I can give you, you would never thirst again. Wow, what what an amazing statement. What an amazing promise. Or in John 7, when Jesus stands before the multitude and he says that he's the source of everlasting water. And that, it, that if you drink from the water that he gives, there will be flowing from within you water forever and ever. That's the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in striking contrast to these false teachers who are like a well. But when you get there, you realize the bucket at the bottom is dry. There's nothing there. They're like the promise of a cloud that comes through as we saw last summer when we needed rain so desperately. And we'd have clouds that would come through and there might even be thunder and lightning, but there was never any rain that came with it. That's these false teachers. You notice what he says at the end of verse 17? Here's some pretty strong language. At the end of verse 17, he says, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For whom the black darkness has been reserved. The irony is they they are teaching things that lead people into darkness, not into light. And God's judgment upon them is that they will be confined to hell forever and ever. 
a place of darkness. Since they were teachers of darkness, they have a place reserved in hell for them. Strong language, isn't it? Second thing he says is they prey on the unsuspecting with alluring words. Verse 18, for speaking out arrogant words of of, of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. So here you get a, a, a combination of both their character and of their methodology. They're arrogant and they're vain. They're the smartest people in the room, and they want everybody to know it on every occasion, right? They speak and they communicate in ways that, that tries to uh, point to this arrogance, to this vanity that is so much a part of who they are, using big words, no doubt, words, however, that have no substance. God is the, uh, some kind of ontological being out there, you know, that he, he is this distant deity. It is this moralistic, therapeutic deism. We have all of this language today. God is whatever you want him to be. He is however you describe him to be. And they go after, Peter says, people who are spiritually naive. They go after people who are weak in their faith. They go after people who are not doctrinally trained in the Scriptures. And they try to lure them. They pull them into their error, appealing even to their fleshly desires, their sensuality. Isn't it? amazing how many times as we've gone through this short little epistle, and you see this obviously in the book of Jude, you see this in other places in the New Testament where the Spirit of God warns about false teachers, how oftentimes we see linked together false teaching and immorality, how many times God says those who teach doctrinal error are also very prone to be teaching a a lifestyle of sensuality and immorality. It's it's amazing, isn't it? It's, It's just... God telling us those two things just have a way of going together. And, you know, sometimes it's not always apparent right away. But I think the wisdom of Scripture would say you watch the life of those who are proclaiming and teaching things contrary to the Word of God. And at some point, somewhere along the way, there is going to be a revelation of who they are as a person. And we, of course, unfortunately have seen this on so many levels uh, in, the, in the history of our own country, even in the last number of years. So they mix this immorality and this spirituality, and they lead people astray with alluring words. Then the third thing he says is they pretend to have freedom. They pretend to have freedom. Look at verse 19, promising them freedom. I mean, who doesn't want freedom, right? Promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. They promise, in other words, what they don't even have themselves. They're promising people freedom. They're promising people liberty. They're telling people, here's a way to to, to have a life without restraint. Here's a way to enjoy anything that you want to enjoy, life without limits. And that's why we all always have this mixing of false teaching and immorality. Because those two just go together, don't they? Freedom and liberty, do what you want, live as you please. There are no consequences. Jesus, however, said in John 8, 34, when he contrasted what it means to be free with what it means to be a slave, Jesus said, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Everyone who commits sin becomes enslaved to sin. Proverbs 5 talks about the cords of sin that bind the cords of sin that bind people's lives. We're a nation that is addicted to the pleasures of sin, aren't we? We're a nation addicted to the pleasures of sin. I don't know if you got to see any of this last week of the life of Whitney Houston and just a little glimpse into how, with such a beginning at at that New Hope Baptist Church in New Jersey, how her life spiraled down to the very bottom and how tragic and how sad it was. And you can bet that there were people along the way who said to her, you can have it all. There are no consequences for the choices that you make. You can do anything that you want, and it's all going to work out fine. There's liberty. There's freedom. You don't need to be inhibited about anything. Bring drugs into your body. It's not going to affect you. Live a life of immorality and sensuality. And I'm not talking about her specifically because I don't know anything about that necessarily. But, but that's the promise that these people make, isn't it? And so we see it lived out every day around us as we are a nation that is addicted to the pleasures of sin. We have sown 
to the wind and we reap to the whirlwind because God has made it very clear that even though the false teachers say that the wages of sin is in death, and even though the false teachers say you can live any way you want without consequence, Paul says in Galatians, God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we reap, don't we? And so here is this warning to us. These people are dangerous. They teach dangerous things. They teach dangerous doctrines. They, they promise things that they cannot deliver, and they are to be avoided. Let's look then at why it is that this is so dangerous in verses 20 to 22. And I want you to see in verses 20 to 22 that I think we're getting a picture here of believers who are being deceived. Again, I told you that some approach this passage and say, these people were saved, but they lost their salvation. Other people approach this passage and say, these people were never saved, and so there isn't a problem then with the result and the outcome. I think that it is absolutely incumbent as we read what these verses say to look at these as a part of what Peter's doing in this letter, and that is he is warning believers about the possibility of being deceived. So I think what is in view is not salvation, but what is in view is sanctification. Not how I come to Christ or whether I have come to Christ, but how it is that I'm walking with God in my daily, my, my daily experience. So let's look then at believers who get deceived. And the first thing that I want us to see is what we know about these people. What do we know about these people who are, in fact, being deceived? Well, the first thing we know is that they've been warned, right? I mean, that's the whole basis of this little letter. We have this letter, and you have the letter of Jude that are basically written to Christians saying, pay attention. And if you look back at that first chapter, remember, he started off by saying in verse 5, be diligent. He said the same thing in verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. Why do we need to be so diligent? Because when he gets into the second chapter, he's describing and unfolding for us what it is that these false teachers do and how they operate and what their message is and and their capacity to lead Christians astray. And so then you look over at chapter 3, and we'll get there in a week or a few weeks, but look at it, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. There it is again. Be diligent. Look at verse 17. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. So clearly in this section, there is a call to diligence. Pay attention. Heed the warnings. It's written to believers. He said in chapter 1, verse 1, that you have the same faith that I have. That's the way he started off, remember? He started off to these readers saying, you have the, we share the same faith. We have both put our faith in Christ. So I, I look at this and I say, this clearly is a warning that is written to God's people. Verse 17 states it as clearly as it can be stated. Don't let unprincipled men lead you, Christians, away from the truth. And so the issue seems to me not to be salvation, but sanctification. So let's look then at what it is that we know about these believers. Secondly, they've escaped, and they know something, don't they? They have escaped. That's the way he describes it for us in verse 20. For if after they have escaped the defilement of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the language that Peter uses in verse 20 describes someone who's put their faith and their trust in Christ. They've escaped. They've been delivered from the world in that sense. The the second thing that he says is they have a knowledge, and not just a general knowledge, but they have a knowledge, and the word that he uses here is epigenosis, which is an intensified knowledge. The object of that knowledge is who? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So here you have those who have a knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every other usage of this word in the book of 2 Peter talks about believers. If this isn't believers, then this is the first time he does that. Of the 20 uses of this word in the New Testament, it speaks in all of those usages of a knowledge that is very thorough, a knowledge that is very specific. And in this case, obviously, that knowledge is in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if these are believers, isn't there a problem then with what happens? Let's look at what we're told about the outcome. So we're, we, we have been warned as Christians about what could happen to us if we don't pay attention. 
all right? So what is the outcome that is possible? Well, I would start off by saying, first of all, it's not a loss of salvation. I don't think he is telling us here that there is the possibility that we're going to lose our salvation, even though there are those who come to this passage and say that's what's going on. As you read these verses, there isn't anything in this passage that says something about uh, eternal judgment. There isn't any reference in these verses 20, 21, 22 to hell, to separation from God. There's nothing here that would indicate that whatever else is happening to these Christians, that it is somehow a loss of their salvation. In fact, I want to suggest to you that what he is talking about has to do with life right here and now. It has to do with a temporal judgment in the life of a child of God if they, in fact, yield to the teaching of these false teachers. So let's look at that. I think what Peter has in mind is that what we end up with is, in fact, a greater bondage to sin. We end up being in a greater bondage to sin. Look at the 20th verse again. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. So if conduct is in view and not salvation, the fact is that they have walked with God for a period of time. Peter is writing this letter to the church. He's writing this letter to Christians. And he is saying, you need to be alert. You need to pay attention. You need to know that there are people out there who are taking things out of the Word, and they're adding to the Word, and they're leading Christians astray. We hear stories about this all the time. We hear testimonies of people who have had this very experience happen to them oftentimes very young in their faith. They fell into a cult. They fell into false teaching, and they were led astray. That is what is being described here. They are drawn away from what? The way of righteousness and from the holy commandment, which I think, again, is the path of sanctification. It is they're drawn away from the path of sanctification. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. The path of the child of God, the way of righteousness is how we walk with God every day, isn't it? And they're going to try to get you to get off of that path, and they're going to try to entice you to go back into the world. They're going to promise you a lot, but they're going to deliver little. They're going to promise you what they don't even themselves have. And so here is this warning to us. As a Christian, I would suggest to you that the reason that their condition is now worse than it was before is because there's nobody more miserable than a child of God who's walking out of fellowship with God. They've already, they've already tried the world, and it didn't work, right? They come to Christ, and because they didn't heed the warnings, because they didn't pay attention to what Scripture said, they get pulled back into the world. The world wants us back, doesn't it? The world doesn't want us to go the way of the Lord. It doesn't want us to walk the way of righteousness. It doesn't want us to follow the holy commandments of Scripture. It wants to constantly pull us back and to entice us back. And so here is a Christian who's walking out of fellowship with God. And as they do that, they are living really a life of misery. The Holy Spirit is convicting them of sin on a daily basis until such time as perhaps they totally shut out that voice that is speaking to them in their conscience. There's no sense of well-being. There's a sense of despair. The false teacher had promised hope, but what they delivered was despair. They're sinning against knowledge. They're inviting God's discipline into their life. You can go on and on with this list of why they're worse off now than they were before. It's a picture, I think, in some ways of what we saw back in chapter 2, verse 7. And if, he cre- and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. I mean, who knew in the Old Testament that Lot was a principled man, a, a man who, who was trying to follow and walk in the ways of righteousness? His life looked a shambles, didn't it? He's sitting at the gate of Sodom. He offers his virgin daughters to men to be abused in any way they want. How could this man in any way be described as he was? because he is a picture of a believer who had forsaken the way of righteousness. And he lived out a life of misery. He did not lose his salvation because Peter says he was a righteous man. And so here is this warning to us. Sin promises us so much, but it delivers so little. 
Thomas Brooks of an uh, era before ours said, what is a golden cup when there is just poison at the bottom? So here is this picture of one who is now in an even greater bondage than before. And then the last thing he says is some of the hardest language that we have for a believer, certainly, and that is that they are in a terrible place to be. Verse 22, it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Here's a description of, of of a life and a lifestyle that is gross and degrading, isn't it? I don't think he's trying to tell us about the dietary habits of dogs or why it is that pigs go back into the mud when they get washed. I think he's using this as a strong contrast of the before and after. Dogs don't generally, I mean, it's it's a gross thing to think about what he says here, but dogs generally want good food, don't they? They know that that didn't satisfy the first time, and yet there's something that draws them back again. And so that's the picture that he gives to us here as a person who has trusted Christ for salvation. They have begun to walk the way of righteousness. They have repented of sin in their life. And yet they fall under the guise of false teaching. And they fall into the snare that these scriptures warn us of repeatedly. And they begin to be enticed back into the world. And they find themselves one day waking up to the fact that they're living life as they had before Christ. And he says, what a miserable place to be. How could it possibly satisfy? It didn't satisfy the first time. How could it possibly satisfy this time? It didn't work before, and it's not going to work now. Look at chapter 1 again, verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. See, we didn't know, verse 9, that this section was coming, but that was a preview of what was coming. 1.9 basically describes this person who's not being diligent, who lacks these qualities, and who has been enticed back into the ways of the world. And we have before us, my friends, here a somber warning indeed that God's Word does not gloss over, it does not cover over my potential failings and your potential failings, but it does draw us to the fact that we are to pay attention to the warnings of Scripture. These warnings are not given to us because they are hypothetical. These warnings aren't given to us because they could happen to somebody somewhere, sometime. They're given to us so that you and I will be attentive to the things that God has called us to do and be, and that we will expressly avoid the temptations and the snares that the world puts before us. So what do we take away? Let me read again, beginning at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and we'll look at this in in a little greater detail next time. But I want to use these two verses just to, to close out our last applications. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Remember how often the Word of God takes us to our mind, doesn't it? Takes us to the place where these decisions are made, and it calls us there as a reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So three things to bring this together. First, stop. Stop. Stop blindly accepting everything you hear. Don't do that. When you hear something, don't just receive it. Be like the Bereans who searched the Scriptures to see if these things were in fact true. Be like the Thessalonians of whom Paul would say, when I came to you and I spoke, you realized that the the word of God was different than the words of men. And that's what we need to be mindful of. We need to stop allowing into our life things that have no place in our lives, that shouldn't get in hearing. Because some smiling face and, and some happy person who believes in a moralistic, therapeutic God is offering them doesn't mean that it's truth, does it? It's to be weighed and measured against the Scriptures. Secondly, look. Look carefully. And I would say this in in regard to three things. Look carefully at the life of the teacher. Look look carefully at the life of the teacher and see, is, is what's being taught being lived? Is what's being taught in any way being contradicted by lifestyle? There's so many obvious examples of this in our world today where where the life and the lifestyles of teachers 
and so-called apostles and prophets and all of the rest and evangelists is so very contrary and different to the, to the, the, the example that we have in, in Scripture. So we are to look at the life of the teacher. Nobody's looking for perfection because we're not going to find that, but we're looking for integrity and we're looking for consistency and we're looking for a heart for God's Word. Look as well into the mirror of the Word yourself. So we look at the life of the teacher, then we look at the mirror of the Word. We want to be certain that we are measuring and constantly looking at the, at the Word ourselves and then look out for each other. I mentioned that last time, but it just struck me again that needs to be emphasized again. Look out for each other. Look out for people who are missing among you. Look out for, for, for things that are happening in people's lives that are going to bring them into circumstances where they may be more prone to hear something that isn't true. You know, when people go through hard times, they sometimes are more susceptible to being pulled aside and pulled astray by somebody who promises something that isn't even true. Be mindful, be looking out for each other, and then listen. So we stop, we look, and we listen. We pay attention to what is said. We are discerning in our spirit. We pay attention to what's said, and we pay attention to what's not said. Sometimes what's not said is as important as what is said. Listen to the Word of God, and listen to the voice of God's Spirit as He confirms and affirms the truth of Scripture. Ultimately, we, of course, want to be absolutely certain that we have put our trust and our faith in only the Lord Jesus Christ, in only the Lord Jesus Christ, not in anything that we're doing, not in any efforts that we're making. We want to be certain that our salvation is grounded in the truth of Scripture, that says to us and declares to us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to this earth in this amazing demonstration of the love of God, and He lived out this perfect life for you and for me. He died on the cross for my sin and for yours, and He was raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And that's why we praise Him as we do in this setting as we already have this morning. If you know Jesus in that way, then you have the gift of eternal life. You have life that is everlasting. You have within you this well of water that will uh, refresh you for all of life. If you do not know Jesus in that personal way, we would invite you even this morning as we close to consider the claims of Christ, who he is and what he has done, and receive the free gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so very much for uh, reminding us uh, so faithfully of uh, what it is that we need to be uh, holding on to, what it is that we need to be pursuing, and, Father, the things that we need to avoid. And I pray your protection over this fellowship of believers. I pray your protection over this church family, Father, that we will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that we will be discerning and wise, that we will have a heart for your word and a heart for the people that you bring to us. Father God, I ask if there is anybody here this morning that does not know Jesus in a personal way, that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would understand that it is not by working that we get to heaven, but it is by the very righteousness of Christ. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.